Hello and welcome to Keep It Classical. My name is Dr. Matthew Nielsen, and in today's video, we begin to explore the period that confuses everyone, the classical period. In case you weren't aware, there's an epoch in classical music that we call the classical period. Don't worry, it's not confusing in the slightest. As with other videos previewing each period, we'll be discussing an overview of the epoch, some historical context, general characteristics, and what kind of listener would enjoy this period. Let's get started. Very often, the classical period is burdened as the de facto example of the entire genre. I've heard countless people say, I love classical music, Mozart and Haydn are my favorites. Consequently, I've heard people who say, I can't stand classical music, Mozart and Haydn are so boring. When most people think of classical music, they also very often think of the music from the classical period, including the three figures that dominate it, Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. Directors and music supervisors know this well, and that's why whenever there's a scene in a film, television, or a commercial that needs classical music in the background, it will almost always be a recording of something from the classical period. Dog fancy, please. Oh, thank you. Good. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Oh. Give me a paper there, will you, Errol? Oh, and uh, one of these. Wife. Did you ever have a chance to read my paper on thermionic transconductance? Would you excuse me? Mitinim, probim asits. Desi, des wird ertrinkt. Nescafe Cappuccino. So viel Schaum muss sein. Nein, Café, ich nicht. Now, while it's not fair to look to this relatively short period of music and extrapolate all of classical music's aesthetics and ideas to an entire genre, what does happen in this period, however, does have a lasting impact on what happens in classical music in the future. Just like we talked about with Baroque music, there's no real set time that things change. Sometimes it starts around the 1720s, and sometimes it doesn't start until 1750, which is the year that Johann Sebastian Bach died. But that doesn't really pass the smell check because Bach didn't single-handedly keep others from composing in this new style. Lots of other composers, in fact, almost every other composer, had started to work in this new style well before Bach died. On the other side, we sometimes have this period end in 1800, and other times it goes clear into the 1820s. Let's talk about the word classical. The word comes from the Latin classicus, meaning belonging to a class. Later, this term will generally come to reflect Greek and Roman style, literature, architecture, and art. Europe's fascination with Greek and Roman antiquity, born again during the Renaissance, was now reaching peak fixation. We started calling this period of music by the name classical after it was labeled that in 1829 by the Oxford English Dictionary. Some other words associated with this period include rococo, galant, and empfinsam. Rococo was the architectural style of the late Baroque with lots of frills and pastoral colors with an overall feeling of lightness and grace. Galant basically means in style or sophisticated, sometimes could be considered in vogue. And empfinsam roughly translates to sentimental style. These three words pretty well encapsulate what the classical period is all about. During this period, the role of the composer was still very much a servant to the patronage. Composers were still composing at the pleasure of the monarchies, nobilities, and to a somewhat lesser extent, the church. During this period, we will see church music, and indeed, the church, as a patron of the arts, begin to fade away in its importance. These composers, for the most part, were on the same level as a cook or a butler. It wasn't about self-expression or artistic vision. It was about fashioning together what the patron wanted, much like a carpenter making a bespoke piece of furniture. Art continued to be a plaything for the powerful, and a way of flaunting one's wealth. Because patronage still runs everything in art during this first part of the period, their tastes play a pivotal role in which composers are getting funding and what they compose. This time period in Europe is generally epitomized by two things, enlightenment 
and revolution. First, enlightenment. The classical period of music happens essentially the same time as the Age of Enlightenment, when reason, philosophy, science, and intellectualism has been growing. This is the time when rational thought, the evidence of the senses, and individual liberty were planted as new seeds of thought. The greater emphasis on science also led to some pretty wonderful inventions. The steam engine, the mercury thermometer, modern steel, as well as the first piano and tuning fork. Enlightenment, however, was a threat to the status quo. This led to the other side of this period, revolution. Revolutions in the colonies of the United States, Haiti, as well as the revolution in France were many of the consequences of these newly enlightened thinkers. This will lead to further conflicts in the War of 1812 and the Napoleonic Wars. One of the least noticed bits of historical context in France, though, was the formation of a new national system of education and the founding of the first modern music school in 1798, the Paris Conservatory. It can't be understated how consequential this institution became, not just to the tens of thousands of music students that would attend, but to the countless other music schools around the globe that it would inspire. Nearly every epoch that we will discuss will begin with some sort of reaction to whatever came before it, and we can see each of these influences in the characteristics of this music. One of the overarching ideas of this period are the same aesthetics founded in classical architecture and art. Formality, order, balance, and hierarchy. The way that we see this reflected in music is through simpler forms, means, and expressions. More song-like melodies, simpler accompaniments, mostly homophonic textures, clean-cut structural forms, and immediate appeal was very much in vogue. Excessive ornamentations, fugues, and anything overtly cerebral gets reined in and pulled back quite a bit. There is a new emphasis on simplicity and immediacy. Later, towards the end of this period, we see the emergence of an idea called Sturm und Drang, which translates to mean storm and stress. It's these brief moments of drama which become a foreshadowing of the Romantic period to come. Additionally, towards the end of the classical era, we begin to see a fixation on the idea of the sublime, the idea that music and art can encompass pure, unfathomable bliss. This can be either through the theoretical idea of the sublime or the affective idea of the sublime. opera of this time period, composed at the behest of the nobility, will often feature the nobility prominently, or not surprisingly, will feature the stories of Greek and Roman antiquity. Harmonically, we see a continuation of the practice of functional harmony that was solidified during the Baroque. 
We don't really see much of an attempt to push the boundaries of harmonic functions here. If anything, we see a reinforcement of those common practice period techniques with a few interesting developments here or there. Perhaps the most enduring legacy of this period is the development of genres we still enjoy today. Genres that began to be formalized during this time period include the string quartet, the piano concerto, and the symphony. So who would this period appeal to? If I'm being really snarky about this, it would appeal to intellectuals, people pretending that they like classical music, film, TV, and commercial directors, and people who think that they're better than you. All joking aside, there's a lot to love about this period, and because the trend was to become more immediately appealing and comprehensible, it can find a wide appeal in many audiences. My dad has often said to me, I just want to go to a concert and hear something that I can hum on my way out of the concert hall. This music is for people like him. I have noticed, though, that this period can be polarizing. I find that older generations really look to this period as the most quintessential period of classical Western music. At the same time, I find that most people my age don't really care for this period nearly as much as others. And further still, I'd venture to say that for many of my colleagues of professional musicians, this is their least favorite period of music. And I get it, because this is a reaction to the complex and heady music that came before it, it can lead to this period of music coming off as pasteurized, oversimplified, and somewhat bland. It feels a bit like the flame has been extinguished. But that's the point of this music. It's not really about passion, it's about pleasure. And I strongly believe that one of the reasons why this period is considered boring by some is because we perform it in a boring way. Some of this is interpretation. But we as professional musicians could do a much better job to perform this music in a more engaging way. Let me show you what I mean. Here are two performances of Mozart's Piano Sonata in C, K545. The first performance is pretty boilerplate, if not a little milk toast. The second one is a slightly riskier interpretation that is meant to keep the listener guessing and engaged. to emphasize that it's okay if this period is not your cup of tea. If you love other parts of classical music, but don't actually really like the classical period, that's okay. Lots of people feel the same way. There are parts that are less palatable, and it can be harder to relate to than music written even earlier than this. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to check out my entire playlist about music from the classical period. You can also watch a playlist about a different period of music. In the meantime, keep it classical.